good? Yes. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the live stream. So I've got Jessica, my Hi. lovely bride, behind the camera tonight. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Hello. She's going to be taking your questions, and I'll be giving you your answers, hopefully. Yeah. Playing anyway. Yep. Oh. Uh, so we've got the camera actually set up on something that I just made here recently. I made a new camera boom. Uh, kind of like a crane, like a crane for the camera to be able to get you in a little closer and into the thing. We won't have to do so much jerky up and down motion with uh, the tripod. So we'll see how this plays, see if we like it any better, and uh, hopefully we will. I know it'll be a great help for doing my regular videos in the future, so... Who's all tuning in, Jess? All right, let's see. The comments are just starting to roll in here. We've got 38 in so far. Good, we good, have good. the Royal Crow Forge for the Honor Forge. George Mew. Hey, good to have you all here. Franklin Jeffers, Ben Ho Hoback, Steve Olean. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Jared Bailey, Corey Shire. I hear a bunch of <laughs> return guests mm -hmm. always. Welcome back to the Forge, guys and gals out there. Thank you all for being here. So. We also have Cyber Tank Belmont, uh, Shadowcaster, Shadowcaster, good to know you all. Brian Neely. Here. Brian Lynn Neely, Bradstad, glad to have you. Nikki Hughes. Nikki Hughes. There's a bunch. How's it going, brother? Awesome. Glad to have everyone here in the live stream tonight. So tonight is going to be a fairly simple live stream. I'm going to see if I can keep it under the two-hour window. I know. Ha ha. That's mm -hmm. funny for Roy. Um, but I'm going to try to stay fairly on point and on task and where we're going with this. So the very first thing that we're going to do tonight is I've got a piece in here heating. And I'm going to cut it off. And then I am going to define, there's the keyword, I'm going to define where the hinge joint is going to be. So essentially I have the front jaw and the vise. We're going to define the hinge area. And then on the rear section of the vise, the rear part of the vise, that is going to have a tenon drawn down on it. And it will, laterly, it will later be threaded and cap nutted off to tighten the handle together with some decorative washers and things of that nature that we'll make uh, to make it more decorative and pleasing. But there'll be a wooden handle then that you can hold it and then do your file with filing with it. Yep. If that makes sense. So once I got that forged down, essentially all the forge work on the main bits are done. And so then you have to take and go to forging on the ball screw, we're going to forge on that uh, next week's live stream. That's going to take a collar weld to forge weld that together. And then there's going to be some cheeks that go on here to turn this into an operating vise. And that's going to be riveted, blind riveted, and then forge welded together in the forge. So there's going to be some forge welding hopefully in the next live stream if we can get around to it. So. So that's what we've got on the docket. So it's going to be really interesting. A lot of, a lot of technique going into this. So I hope you guys will enjoy this. Yeah. All right. What well, we got? Any questions? All right. Uh, everybody's pretty much greeting each other. Lots of hellos. Awesome. Uh, Charles May. He posed, "Is anyone going to be in Richmond?" So yeah, yeah. We still got a couple months on that, but something to keep in mind, yeah. definitely. And where, where's the? Where's the Banner Conference? Uh, Richmond, Richmond Virginia. Richmond, Virginia, yeah. Uh, we had thought about going to the Abana Conference, but then again, I've also, I, I think I may skip the Abana Conference this year and trade for maybe next year. And I've got a few classes that I'm going to be taking this year. One with Douglas Pryor. I don't know if anybody knows of his work. I'll be taking, hopefully, you'll be getting in on a class with him. And then I've got a couple Tom Latney classes that I'm going to be taking this year. So uh, that and work and YouTube and mm -hmm. everything and its brother. We'll see. We'll That's see right. how far along I get. <laughs> That's right. Lots going on. Yep, lots going on. So all right, I'll wait for everybody to get in here. And... All right, we're up to 48. Um, okay, good to have everybody. For everybody who liked my video, thanks so much. Yep. Uh, Speaking of which. <laughs> 
They're done. They are done. So we're going to be giving those away in this video also mm -hmm. as well. So, But for all those of you freeloaders that just came for the giveaway and not to listen to me talk, we're going to make you wait a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pay, out, pay attention throughout the whole thing. Yep. So. Uh, Brian Neely says, how about a shout out for Tuan? He is trying hard to get his subscription numbers up. Yeah, yeah. So, uh... If anybody doesn't know Tuan from Warp Legacy, he is a great guy. He's got a great channel. He's putting a lot of effort into it. And YouTube just recently, again, changed the format of what it is to, in order for you to be part of their partnership program, which allows you to get paid AdSense money. And so he was doing really good. He was getting ready to, he was getting up to where he was going to meet the requirements. And well, they just set the bar a lot higher. So now you have to have at least a minimum of a thousand subscribers, and you have to have four thousand hours of watch time. And right now, as of today, I believe Tuan has three hundred and forty-five subscribers. He's got a lot of really great comical content that you may like. You may want to check check him out and go show him some love. Mm -hmm. um, and for anybody who subscribes to me and has the jingly bell for the notifications. Uh, I do posts about guys that I feel that you know you need to go check out and things like that. I do little posts like that on the community tab, so it'll just look kind of like a Instagram post or like a Facebook post where I put their channel, video, and a link. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So if you get some time tonight after the live stream, go show Tuan some love. <coughs> Yeah, definitely. Want, he's he's uh, definitely a good channel. I'm I'm one of his patrons over there. That's not a brag. He just got another patron, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, that helps support little channels like that as well. Especially when it takes about a thousand of you guys to make a one penny. Or well, not one penny. It's about a thousand of you to watch an ad or interact with an ad in some way for you to get about a buck. So. That's how the AdSense works. I don't know if anybody knows that. And that's a really generic number. It works different for different channels and different people and tiers and whatnot. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Just Stanley says, hi, guys. T-shirt came in yesterday. Looks great. Thanks. Um, awesome. So I'm going to hop up there by Roy for a second if I if we have a second before you uh -oh. have to pull it out. Is there going to be a little model? I, I am. I'm going to model the T-shirt. Are you going to keep it G-rated? <laughs> of course. Of it's going to be G-rated. Good. So, okay. Good Let's answer. See. Hopefully I'm... <laughs> I shouldn't be in, in shot here. Here, I'll stay in front of you. Um, right. Yeah, we have logo, logo t-shirts. Uh, it's teespring.com slash Christ Center Ironworks. And this is our one uh, type. And we also have a beam, beam hammer one up as well. Uh, I believe that one's teespring.com slash beam hammer. Yep. If anybody else is, uh, would like to support us yeah, by I'm getting some merch. Yeah, you don't have that one on? I don't have that one today. It's dirty. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Jared Bailey, he said, I want to be a blacksmith. Do you have any tips for me? Get started with however you can get started. Even if it's clanging a rock on a rock anvil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I the best way to get started really is find a local blacksmithing group to you and get in touch with the guys there. You're going to find a wealth of knowledge, people that are more than more than capable and willing to help you learn and they can also point you in the right direction as far as finding tools what tools to stray away from and things like that so uh, that would be my best suggestion for you yeah and if you can once you've gotten once you've gotten the bug enough and you've done some hammering and things take a class with someone take a class that's offering a good beginner class on the fundamentals and things like that and you'll be on your way. Cool. Okay. Steve Olan says, Roy, you guys inspired me to sign up for LAMA. I'm guessing that's a forging group. Awesome. awesome. Mm -hmm. oh. Sorry, I'm all like boogery tonight. It's cold, but not as cold as it's been. Yeah, it is warmer. So that's, I think it's in the 30s yep. or something like that. So oh I'm getting God. more cold hardy as the winter progresses. Mm hmm. We're supposed to be having some 50 degree temps here in Ohio. Yeah. Up real soon. Yep. When that happens, I'll probably be out here in the nothing but a t-shirt. <laughs> Just like every winter. All right, we're hot. Ready? So, All right. yep. 
All right, so we're going to swing you around. You all have to tell us if this is any better of a way of doing it. She's going to try to be gentle as possible. You might want to back off a little bit. Back up, oh. Back it up just like us. Can everybody yeah. see that okay? It should be good. All right. Not too shaky, I hope. Are they good? Yep, they're good. You can All see right. Off tool. Okay, so we have five eighths inch square stock. As a recap, this five eighths inch square stock, we're going to go roughly a little more than a cube of material. So in metric, that's 16 mil square. So we're going to go just a little more than 16 mil. And we're going to hammer on this and try to cut her off here. We're going to want to try to cut as close to center as we can and keep it even. That's the key here. You want to keep it nice and square. And hopefully I'm not distorting that eye too much. There we go. If I am, there's nothing I can do about it because the slack tub's frozen. All right, so there we go. Now we nubbed it off there. Get this locked up here nice and tight with my tong clips. Hopefully that'll hold a little better. Now you don't want to have to worry about dressing this off too much right now at this point. That little crown in the point of this is actually going to help us out. That little crown at the top where we've cut to center is actually going to help us push the material evenly this way, squeezing it down that way. So that's what we want. So I'll take a measurement on this. I'm not going to do the metric math on it. Um, I'm not sure what it is for metric, but right at the tip of the cut, it's 25 mil or one inch. And right where at the back of the cut, what I would consider the true stock measurement, it's roughly from the shoulder, yeah, it's right around seven eighths of an inch. I don't know what that is in metric. You'll have to forgive me. Somebody help me out in the comment section down below. Um, so <clears throat> that's what we're shooting for. And we got it. Good to go. You have to get the other one to match then? Nope. The other one's going to have a tenon drawn down on it for a handle. Okay. All right. So I, didn't, I got minimum distortion in the eye. There might have been a little bit of distortion in it. But that's okay if it, if it gets too distorted by the time I'm done shaping this end, what we can do is we can just rerun the drift through it because we're not done with it, so don't worry about it. So there we are. That's what we're at so far. Now we'll take another heat, and now we're going to work this to where it's more protruded out that way. 22 mil. Is that, was that 78? Yes, 22 mil. All right. I'm going to write that down. Commit it to memory. Awesome. Thank you for the help on the measurement. Up on the chalkboard. I know my writing, you can't read it, but I can, so that's all that's necessary. <laughs> I might try to cool this off a little bit. Okay. All right. Questions? Yes, uh, Steve. Uh, Steve Stokes says, "Can I use an axe head as a cutoff tool, or do I need something more substantial?" An axe head would be fine if you have a way of putting it, mounting it into the hardy hole of your anvil, or something, uh, something of that nature. You don't want it to kick around on you. Hardy tools are very dangerous to start with. You want to be very careful of that. Uh, a lot of guys will use different stuff. I've seen guys use old splitting malls, stuck in a stump, things like that. Um, you can get by, certainly, on a lot of redneck ingenuity, if you will, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, Jerry rigging, however you want to call it, whatever a slang term you want to use for it. But uh, that, that ingenuity there will take you so far, but you don't want to go so far with it that it becomes dangerous. Going in an axe, standing upright, that's a danger in the shop, especially if it's mounted to something solid. 
and it doesn't go away to a safe place after you're done using it. So mm, yeah. if you notice how I put my hardy tool back away, that's just a safety precaution. I don't, there's not a, not a call like I would lose a finger on it while in use because it is to the left hand. I use my right hand to swing and hit with. So there's not a danger there. But if I were to fall or trip over something and land my face on that or, you know, an arm, especially if you got a sharp party tool, it can cut you real bad. So. Does it need more heat still? Be careful. Oh yeah, much more heat. Okay. All right, Game and Forge, they said, I have a forge and I have been trying to figure out how to charcoal so that I can save money on fuel. And they had asked just previous to that how to, uh, if you'd do a video on how to make charcoal. Okay, I'll give you a real good, give you a real good rule of thumb there. So I know a lot of guys like to make charcoal and they think they're saving themselves a buck. You're not saving yourself anything. Charcoal is almost one of the most wasteful things to have to try to make. And I know this from working with Tom Latnick. He used a lot of green wood because charcoal's just got so gosh darn expensive per bag full and you go through a lot of it. Well, you've got to chop down a whole lot of trees on the face of this earth to develop enough charcoal uh, to do any good smithing with. So. I can do a video on how to make charcoal. It is not that difficult to make. I'll do that. Guys have done it before. Um, and trash cans, things like that. It's a very similar process. If you've ever seen anybody make char cloth, it's the same thing. You want the wood to essentially burn without burning. Or char. You just want it to char. You don't want it to become consumed and turn to ash. Uh, you want to bring it up to that point where it burns off the gases of the wood, but it leaves behind the carbon element. So, um, same thing like with char cloth in a tin can. It's a similar effect, but I could definitely show how that's done. Okay. Uh, Daniel Moss is here. He says, ask if we're working on the vice some more. Yep, sure am, Dan. Glad to have you here, pal. Big Dog Ford says, hi guys, happy Friday. Hey Tim, happy Friday. Oh. And a little birdie told me, I think it was Dan himself, in one of his videos that he was going to make a large vice at some point in time for one of his get, for one of uh, his subscriber benchmarks. So if you haven't seen Daniel Moss's channel yet, you may want to go check him out. Because once he, and subscribe. That way you can make him put his money where his mouth is. Because I want to see the vice. I want to see the vice. <laughs> Are you trying to start a chant here? Yeah. Like, Everybody say chant. that. Everybody say that. Daniel Moss is making a vice. Everybody in the house will probably think you're silly, but they'll be like, why are you chanting at your phone? Uh, Jeremy Kilgore says, just wanted to say your tong videos have inspired me to get over my fear of making them. Awesome. I've made three not ugly pot pairs so far and trying bolt tongs tomorrow. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's the first trick to do make a not ugly pair. Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good. Awesomeness. Let's see. Thomas Urso got my forge going, making some S hooks. Had fun. Cool. Awesome. awesome. That's how the addiction starts. Uh, Mike JV said Tom Latney is a great guy. Worked a few classes with him. Yes, he is. Tom Latney. Sorry, delayed response there. Is <laughs> like processing that information. Yeah, Tom Latney. He is an awesome instructor. Awesome friend. Couldn't ask for better. Rigid Ironworks, uh, previously Digger Blade, says I am forging and watching at the same time. Do I have talent or what? LOL. You have a lot of talent. <laughs> you need to come work for a professional blacksmith. Think of what you could do if you were 100% paying attention to what you're doing. <laughs> oh. All right. I'm ready, ready to come this? out. All right. We've got time for one more comment. All right. Uh, I've got to bring it out, though. So. Steve Stokes, am I better off with a bench grinder or an angle grinder? Depends on what you're doing, Steve. They do two separate things. 
Um, an angle grinder is more versatile than just a straight up bench grinder and in a lot of respects less dangerous. But they have their pros and cons. So I don't think I'll be able to get across the anvil with it, so I'm going to be here. Okay, back so, there. Yep. Gotcha. So I'm actually going to be across here because the thing's short, so I need to get it right there. Yeah, is it right here? Uh, yeah, Aim it. Bring it in a little closer. Okay. Can go. you see it just fine? Yeah. Everybody can see that edge just fine? Good to go. All right. So here we go. We're going to find that edge that I established originally. And we're going to drive this back to itself. We're going to try to remember to keep this area straight and flat and not let it distort too much. And all I'm trying to do is just ground this up. Now technically I could have just ground this. That would have been fine too. I don't know if everybody can see that fine. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. So after you have all this work in this, it's really good to just take your time. Dress this out really nice. We're not using really hard blows or anything. These are just really just kind of shaping blows. All right. I don't know if anybody can see that there. Yep, that works. Okay. So there we have it. So we're kind of radiusing off that front side, and we're going to round it back in here. And you're going to see this additional thickness I had in here is going to thin out a little bit as I continue to work this to a round. That's why we wanted to leave that a little thicker yet than what this was up here, because it's going to thin down just to fuzz more yet before we get it done. Anybody see that? Okay, let's see what we got here. Big dogs forged us. He missed it. Could you do it again? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have to forge a whole new piece. <laughs> Tim, I think you're out of luck on that one, buddy. So, I had some pretty good, uh, I'll just share this real quick. So, I had some pretty good responses on people, what they're interested in seeing this upcoming year. Um, one thing I will definitely be doing more of is lock making. So I know Tim at Big Dog Forge, he was wanting to see some of that. And I know there's definitely a few other people that wanted to see regular commenters and subscribers. Um, so I've got some lock videos in the works. Um, and I think they're going to be really good ones. I think people are going to enjoy those. We're going to go from very basic, just kind of your little slide bolt things. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time there, but kind of just talk a little bit about the theory behind what you're doing. Um, now I'm not a lock, locksmith at all or master locksmith or any of these things at all. So you can take the terminology I use and the information I have with a very small grain of salt. I am not an expert on this at all. I do know how to move the material and I understand the concepts uh, pretty well. So, you know, I'm going to rely heavily on Tim at Big Dog Forge to give me <laughs> correction critiques. as I go along and critiques to let me know what I've called the wrong thing. Charles May says, cool, I'm a Peter Ross fan. Yeah, Peter Ross, he's a good guy to take a class from too. <laughs> Steve Olin, don't come to Roy for terminology. <laughs> no, don't count on me for saying anything right. So, every now and then, every now and then, I get the politically correctness police on me. And every now and then I get the grammar patrol on me <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then just a few sensitive ninnies all at the same time. Uh, take everything I say with a grain of salt. I, you know, I, I'm not interested. If I was interested in being an English lit major, I would go do that. But I'm a blacksmith and a ruffian and an all around nice guy. Yeah. Those, some of your words could probably be added to the dictionary, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more than a few, probably. <laughs>
Uh, let's see. Oh, JG Clark, 45. Missed you guys last week. Is that what she said? Yeah. Okay. Yep, we've had a few people. Yeah, we're glad you guys missed us. Um, there's we're a big storm. Yeah. yeah. We had a big storm coming through last week, so we had to put off the schedule. We had to schedule it out, but... Let's yeah. see. Oh, and real quick, before I, before I take another comment, mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to take and thank everybody for all the love on the on the video about the giveaway hammer and, and stuff like that. And people have been sharing their stories and things. We really greatly appreciate that. Uh, that's really all we were after. We didn't have any side angles on that. We just wanted to hear from you guys and and you know what you guys have been inspired to do. You know, in the world of blacksmithing. And uh, I apologize for my first video that I did not explain it out good enough in detail, I guess, our reasonings of why changing the format for the giveaway a little bit. But I hope my secondary video, if you haven't seen it, uh, did better for you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Daniel Moss says, Roy, if I get a chance to come out to the States this year, would I be able to come and play in your workshop with you? Absolutely yes. And might I suggest, if you want to pick a time to come out, the perfect time would be to come out during Quad State. Mm -hmm. That's in the last weekend or the fourth weekend, because sometimes September has five weekends. But it is the last weekend of September, generally, as a rule of thumb, or the fourth weekend of September. If you can plan that date, that would be great. I'll show you a good time while you're here. Yeah, lots of blacksmiths, lots of... Tools. That and for anybody who'd like to come out around that time, that's like uh, that's perfect timing. So I pretty much take a big, big holiday come Quad State. So every year, rain or shine, whether yeah. kids are being born or not. <laughs> yeah, actually, our second child was uh, due right at the beginning of October, and he still went to Quad State. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I still went to Quad State. So. I know, great husband and all. <laughs> well, she wasn't born during that weekend, so it worked yeah. out. <laughs> she had, she had, she had false pains and stuff, so I did leave one day early. <laughs> but I debated on it, and I asked her a lot of questions over the phone. I like, are you really? Yeah. Are you real? Are you sure? Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, this is hot. Let's bring it out the anvil. All righty. We're gonna be right around the same area. Okay. Town. You good? Yep, good. Got me in shot. Ran heel. Yep. Coolio, coolio. All right. So now I'm just going to try to work at knocking that knob off the end there. It's the easiest done right here on the anvil face. And then I'm going to hook it over and continue to press it over. So the biggest thing to remember if you're trying to make something round, don't keep it in one spot. Don't keep hitting the same spot over and over again because all you're doing is developing a flat. So always keep the material moving unless you have a specific need of hitting one spot over and over again. And that's going to take one more heat to refine that. An extra 10 minutes here will save you about an hour of file later. So take an extra 10 minutes and get it as close as you can. So as you can see, we still got a little bit more work to do on that yet. We still got some bumps there. But you can see how much more that protruded over. Mm -hmm. And you might be noticing that area is thinning out a little more and more. So there we have it. So I, next heat, I need to come here and knock off this edge. There you go. Alrighty. Any questions? Yes, we do have a question. Steve Stokes says, is there any real difference between coal and propane forging? Uh, a lot. Huge difference. 
Um, as far as functional, okay, so as far as the aspect of heating material, no, there is no difference. I mean, it's still getting the metal hot as long as you achieve the same temperature with the, rather the gas forge. You back them up just yep. a fuzz thing. Yep. Um, please and thank you. Uh, with a coal forge, okay, with a coal forge, you can get a lot hotter and more intense localized heat on the areas that you want it and not on the areas that you don't. Like right now, I've got most of this outside the realm of where the hot spot is in the forge, so I'm keeping most of it cold while I'm heating up the very specific location that I want hot, that little nub on the end. You can't do that in a gas forge. The whole thing's hot, and you just have to deal with it moving around on you. So that means if you got your tongs up at a slight angle and you go to hit it, it bends it. You know, and you'll have that problem. As far as the difference, like, like is one hotter than the other? No. I mean, as long as you bring them up both to the same temperature, uh, it's they're the same. It's the same type of heat, really. Um, I will let you know that they produce a different type of surface scale. So a coal forge will pro produce a lot darker surface scale, as where a gas forge will produce more of a gray scale. It'll look grayer in color after you're done forging on it. So those are really the only two differences I see. I get asked all the time which one's better, which one should I get, get both. I'm the wrong person to ask about that because I'm not sold out to any particular methodology or tool. I'm not. I If it's efficient and it works, I use it pretty much. Um, you know, I've been proven wrong lots of times. There's some guy said, hey, you're going to like that better. I'm like, no, I'm a, I'm, a, uh, I'm a diehard this guy. And, you know, I said I wouldn't ever have a gas forge because I didn't want a gas forge. I didn't like gas forges. And, Lord and behold, I've got a gas forge because I'm lazy. I like gas forges now. So Scott Hicks asked what the difference, the cost difference is between coal and propane. The cost difference, that one's a little harder to nail down. Mm -hmm. It's going to depend. I don't want to give you a bunch of generalities and act like I'm avoiding the question. Um, but it's going to depend on your location, your region. But what I have found in my own region, in my personal thing, coal is cheaper than what gas is. It's way cheaper than what gas is. Mm -hmm. uh, the fire you're seeing here, I can run almost an eight-hour day in of simple forging. I'm calling this simple forging. This isn't heavy use. This is... Bare bones, as basic as it gets, kind of forging here. Mm -hmm. Easy. This is easy forging, okay? If you're doing a lot of forge welding and things like that, you're really going to pour through the coal when it comes to that. Or heating, big um, like chunks of metal. Or heating. Yeah. To give you an ideal, it costs me right around 40 bucks to fill a 100-pound propane cylinder. It's right around there, roughly. I don't know the exact cost. And... It, so it cost me about 40 bucks, and I go through about one cylinder a week, and I've got three cylinders. So whatever that is, that's 80, 90, 120. So that's $120 a month is what I've got in propane myself. Mm -hmm. as, far as, the, as far as the coal pile out there, I've got two tons of coal that I bought last year, and it's still out there, and I've maybe used a ton at about $274 a ton. Mm -hmm. So, way cheaper. Yeah, we got a couple of comments in on this. Um, okay. Steve Olin, I have to ship my coal in, but I still prefer it to gas. Uh, Jack F, tractor supply, $6 for a 40-pound bag. Uh, Len Brandstad, same here, it's $5 for a 50-pound bag. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... Now, and the other difference there is I'm going to do a video at some point me and Twan at Warp Legacy, when he was out here for Quad State, we were going to do a comparison video on Bimutimus coal versus the anthracite. It does burn differently. It does burn differently. I've used, uh, I have had seen some guys with the anthracite, and then it's, there's no comparison to smithing in it versus Bimutimus coal. Now, as far as what those differences is, I want to push it to its limits. So I'm going to put, I'm going to build a test forge. It's one of my ideals. 
and run them side by side and see what type of results we get. Mm -hmm. So that way I don't run my mouth about something I don't know any clue on, really. Let me see here, you guys, I'm trying to read back through the comments. Uh, yeah, somebody had commented that um, where they're at because of wildfire danger, he can't use coal, um, so he sticks with for, uh, propane. But. Yep, in that case, the propane's the excellent option for you. Um, and even better yet is if you could use, uh, you know, induction heating, mm -hmm. if you have the money to spend on a unit. For induction heating, that that'd be another great thing. Uh, Jared Bailey says, "Where do you think I could get me tools like anvils for cheap?" Uh, and I believe he had asked earlier about getting um, some different okay. anvil tools. So right now, you're not going to find any good anvil for cheap, for the most part. Mm -hmm. There's a mad rush and grab on them ever since forged and fire. Um, so if you find one, it's kind of a unicorn occurrence. I know you can buy really cheap anvil shaped objects down at you know like at Harbor Freight that's what I started with I started with a Harbor Freight anvil and I worked on it for three years and it held up fine um, it wasn't in great shape when I was done with it and but then being a beginner it didn't matter um, on that end of things my work didn't require a pristine anvil then um, one of the best ways to do is find yourself a large chunk of steel from a scrap yard if you can get it. Uh, some people use railroad rail. They ring like a bell. I'm not a fan of railroad rail. Uh, a large chunk of steel, hell, there's people who even do it with uh, sledgehammer heads. Jerry Bailey says, would rail railroad track work if you used an angle grinder? Uh, if you're trying to cut a horn, I mean, you can. Uh, the, the problem with railroad track is it's... It, it's it's wrong. The mass is all wrong on a railroad track. You can get it done and you can use it, certainly. But a railroad track looks, on a cutaway, something like this. Now, I'm not going to draw this accurate, so you'll have to you know, give me some slack on that. But that's essentially your basic railroad track thing. And what an anvil needs is mass to be a good anvil. Hmm. You need more mass. This right here, this webbing, a lot of times from, from this side of it to that side of it, thickness, it, a lot of times it's only three-eighths of an inch thick. If it's a large anvil track, that might be half-inch thick material, but you're essentially hammering. Your mass flow is through a half-inch thick piece of webbing. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is every blow that you put on this and connect with it, the energy goes into bending or bowing that webbing and not towards shaping your metal. So you're losing cut kinetic energy is what you're losing there. Mm -hmm. So same thing if you hit something thin that's standing up on end, it's going to want to bow. It's going to want to bend. If you have really long punches, for some, like really long thin punches and you hammer on it, it bows and it kicks and it vibrates your hands. Mm -hmm. Real bad. Uh, if you don't believe me about this effect, take any 3 8 inch bar, set it on an anvil or set it on a block or a rock, and then hammer the end of it. And that thing's going to twist and beat in your hand so bad it's going to ring your it's going to ring your fist. And what that is is that's that kinetic energy being resisted by whatever you're banging it on, bowing out to the side. It's going into horizontal motion or lateral motion versus vertical up and down. Hopefully that answers that question. So just grinding a horn on this doesn't take care of this problem. So one of the best things you can do is if you've got a railroad track anvil, not to knock them, is find two plates to stuff in here. Yeah, somebody mentioned that. And weld that in solid. Mm -hmm. Or as solid as you can get it to stop that bowing effect, which it'll also cut some of the ring. All right, I'm good. Okay, is it heated up? Yep. All right. And it's hot. Gotta stay on point here. All right. Ready? Yeah. Same area. 
Anvils are one of those hard things right now to come by, but don't be discouraged. They will come down in price. You just have to take your time and be patient. I had to be very patient for my first anvil that I got, first real anvil. There's no shortcuts to the top, so to speak. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that old adage, but there really isn't. You kind of you have to pay to play the game, unfortunately. Now, that may sound real easy coming from a man who's got a 465-pound anvil, but I've worked on really poor-looking anvils for a long time before I got to this. This thing, Olga, here's only what, about a year old now, honey? Getting to there? Yep, just about a year. About a year old. Alright, I can fiddle with that some more off camera. I think you guys get the point on that. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep this ball rolling. But I'm gonna show you the roundness here. So really you just keep doing that until you get it ever more round. So that's the front jaw. Hopefully everybody likes that. Hey, good night, big dog. Tim at Big Dog Forge, we'll see you, buddy. Thanks for stopping in. You're welcome for the live stream. Yeah. I also need to do a little straightening on it and stuff. I'll do that a little later on for the next live stream. All right, so we got that piece pretty much done. I'm going to move on to drawing down the handle bit. That way I don't have to make you guys watch for 45 minutes of me dressing that up to where I'm fanatically happy about it. So, so we got that bit done. We're going to set it off over here on the floor to cool. While it cools, we're going to work on our other part. But before we do that, we're going to have a word from our sponsors. No, just joking. <laughs> it's not going. I know. I, well, it probably just plummeted, didn't it? Uh, the audience not number? Not yet. Oh, no? It went down to. Yeah, it just went do down to. See? They went uh -huh. They went for a potty break. Now they're going to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the word from our sponsors is this. We're going to take and give away the meat skewers. Oh, okay. That's what you're talking about. Uh, yep. Yeah. And I'm actually going to have Jessica. I get to do it. Yep. I'm going to have Jessica stand in front of the camera. All righty. And I'm going to draw the name. Okay. Since she made the meat skewers, I'm going to stand around here with you guys. There's some good names in here for the meat skewers. Oh, all right. All right. Now I get to tell him, no peeking, Roy. All right, I'm not peeking. You guys can see it. This is fair. See, my hands are in front of the camera. Okay? There's no magic here. I get one name. One name defines who gets these wonderful meat skewers. Hands still in front of the camera. Okay. Hands still in front of the camera. Keep it visible. All right. Let's see here. Let's open it up. We're going to find out together. She's not even going to know. I don't She's even She's not know. even going to know. I can't even read it from here. What's it say? All right. Let's see Belchamere? I can't read it from here. All right. So this is Jesse Belch Amber. <laughs> Somebody okay. says move your hands. Can't see Jess. <laughs> so there you go. You can announce okay, it. Can Sorry, my hands are in the way. There. It should be good and clear. All right. So yeah, uh, 48 hours. You got 48 hours to get with us, Jesse. Uh, best way to contact us is go to blacksmithpdfs.com and up in the right hand corner you'll see the contact button and you can just drop us a message there and it'll go straight to our inbox. Yep, so. yep. Congrats, Jesse Beltzimmer, or whatever. That's a hard last name to pronounce. So, yep, yep, yep. We're cutting in and out. All right, let's see here. Are we still cutting in and out? Is, is, the, it, is there a flag is the in the feet corner good? for us? There's no flag in the corner for us on this end. Yeah. 
So hopefully we're good. Probably everybody will have to chime in if it is. Um, somebody saying, someone saying yes, yeah, some, somebody saying a lot. Hmm. Well, perhaps it'll be smoothed out on the replay if for some reason you miss some of it. Seems like the focus is being a bit weird. Okay. I'm not sure what that is. Is this because it's zoomed out, honey? Uh, it can be zoomed go. out. How's that work? Well, besides you being zoomed in. All right. Does that look a little better for anybody? Okay. Virginia has been dropping in and out. Okay. Well, right now the feed's saying it's good on our end, so I'm not sure if we could do anything about that, so we apologize for anybody who's not in on that. So, the focus comes and goes. Yeah, um, I, think it's, I think it's the phone. It's probably time for an upgrade. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> it, it, it just zooms in and out and flutters a little bit. So, all right. So, that'll be that. All right. Back to on, regular programming. Yeah, right? back to your regular programming. This ugly guy. <laughs> Glad to have you. <laughs> Alright, we're gonna get a drink here and Okay. Let's see. Oh, there's one. I saw this message earlier. Fruchin Fruchin Forge. Would a braided post be weaker? Would a what? Braided post. I don't know what a braided post is. Okay. I'm sorry. Elaborate on that and then I'll read it when it comes back up. Okay. Uh, Champ Ironworks, guys, making the skewers is a great beginner project, and Roy has a few videos to give you all the specs you need. Go make your own. Yeah, thanks for that. Let's see, Prescott Stoops, someone donate Roy a super camera. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, a super camera. Uh, BJ Waters, hey, I had to wrangle a four-year-old and eleven-month-old who were ready to tear the house down because my wife turned her head for a third of a second. Did I miss any big catchphrase or anything big? Um, a Jesse Belchmer won the contest, BJ Waters. So now yeah. you know. Uh, Roy, does your forge chimney just draft air? No fan or anything? Um, yeah, it's just a natural draft. Uh, it's not a great draft. And the reason why is that my smoke stack is not high enough. Because I got a lot of trees immediately near, so I'm kind of in a bit of a low spot compared to everywhere else. And so I need to run the smokestack a lot higher up into the sky in order to get a good draft out of it. But I plan on just remedying that instead of having to put on a great big old long pipe by doing a blower system and doing a forced uh, draft. Corey Shire, uh, that large copper bowl you showed off in one of your videos, uh -huh. uh, could you make that into a bathroom sink basin? That would be cool. Yep, you sure can. In fact, I made one for my mom and dad's little tiny house that they have, and one day I might take you all over there and show you that. Uh, they made like a little small cabin, tiny house cabin, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's really just cutting a hole in it and installing sink plumbing. Just standard plumbing. Hold on a second, let me grab that. All right, stepping away for a moment. Yep. All right. Is it still heating up? Yep. Okay. I Bill. just need to use a glove on it to get close enough to burn oh. my hands. So. Ah, he actually feels something in his hands. No, I just don't. Oh, you would prefer to have feeling if it does decide to come back one day? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Bill I Williams. not to have cooked hot dogs for fingers. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. Bill Williams says, what are your thoughts on charcoal? You kind of shared, delved into this a little bit earlier. Yep. Um, um, my thoughts my thoughts on charcoal is this. If charcoal's what you got, use it. Um, charcoal's way too much work. Way too much work. Uh, it's also a pretty good fire hazard because it puts off what they call fire fleas. Or lots of little pops and sparks and embers, especially if you're in a humid area. It has a tendency to do it even more. And anywhere in your shop that may have a bit of lint stuck somewhere, those embers always seem to find themselves to a nice, dry, tumultuous place. So 
I personally do not like charcoal. Now, as far as to forge weld in, things like that, if you can keep enough charcoal on the fire, it's a beautiful thing because there's no clinker. There's not really any impurities to really get and inhibit the weld. So as long as you don't crank too much airflow through it, you're good to go. Yeah, Paul's garage, he says, can confirm that char charcoal shoots hot sparks. That it does. <laughs> you sound experienced. <laughs> I heard a story one time from an older gentleman at my blacksmithing club that he actually was forging in charcoal and he had the sparks come off that charcoal mm -hmm. and actually went up into his attic. He was working under like just outside the door and went up through the soffit mm -hmm. and found its way up in his insulation and they had to call the fire department and nearly burnt down his house. And it was just one spark. Uh -huh. One little ember found its way up. I think he had cellulose or some sort of, it was like the shredded newspaper kind of insulation. It was a really old home. Yeah. And uh, they nearly lost their house over it. So That sounds problematic. Yep. To the forge, the anvil, I mean. Yep, we're going to go to the anvil. Okay. And by the way, Fruition Forge said... He had said about the braided, if you took the part that is going to be your post and split it into three sections and braided it for decoration, would that make it weaker? Probably, yes. Because it wouldn't be one solid consolidated mass. You might have to just zoom it out, honey. Okay. I zoomed it in to get a little better quality, but... Let's see here. What we're looking at. No, that'll work. Uh, that okay. works good. All right. Steve Olin says, good story, Roy. <laughs> Paul's Grog says, better up in the attic than his kilt. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right, fine sir. All right, so here I really don't know any ideal. I'm going to do about three inches from the boss. That should give me more than enough for the handle so I don't end up short. I'm just going to do that. This, if you want to. Cut it off the center if you can. Siebel Wolf says, What about a twist in the post, Roy, for decoration? Uh, I don't think that would be as bad because it would still be a solid mass, hopefully, under. Before I cut that off, I'm gonna go ahead and brush it. Just get some of the junk off of it. You guys can see what I'm doing? So three inches, I'm gonna measure this. Three inches would be roughly 75 mil. So you guys maybe want to check that. Uh, dimension if I'm wrong. We got that cut off. Get rid of that. I'm going to go ahead and measure it for everybody. It looks like, yeah, I was way off on my original estimate. It is, actually, believe it or not, that's uh, two inches. I said three. I should have said two. Mm -hmm. Just a little, just a fuzz over two inches of material. So 50 mil then. Yep, so 50 mil long. All right, we're gonna get a grip here. The, j the tongs I'm using are just a form of box jaw tongs to hold three quarter inch wide, flat stop. And this is where the bolt and the flat jaw tong comes in handy. I mentioned this in these tong making videos when I made this pair of tongs, mm -hmm. that, that this is very handy to have this opening in here like a bolt jaw. And this is why. You can see how handy that's become now. Just like that. So, all right, so now the next step in this process is just underneath here, uh, roughly about a cube of material, so a 5 8 inch cube of material or 16 mil uh, cube of material, we are going to take and draw out a tenon. And that tenon, 
We're going to draw it all by hand, but we're going to use a few things to aid us in this process. Now you could do this all right at the anvil with nothing but hand hammer and anvil edge. I've done that before, but I'm going to take the cheaters route and I'm going to use a guillotine tool. Uh, if you have a buddy helping you, you can have a top and bottom guillotine tool and set hammer. And that works really well too as well if you want to do it more traditionally than using a guillotine tool. Any questions? Yes. There's a few comments and questions about the copper bowl work. Uh, Rigid Iron Works says, I really love the look of the copper bowls. And Len, Len Bradstead says, what was the tool you had in the vise to roll the rim of the big copper bowl? Okay, roll the rim of the big copper bowl. The vice, the vice tool that I use to do that. Ah, no problem. Okay. Essentially a two by four with a rounded off edge. Simple tools. <laughs> Simple tool. Uh, when you're working with copper, it's soft. It's really soft as long as it's not hot. You can get away with using wood everything to work with it. Mallets, wooden mallets, wooden stakes, things of that nature, and this is perfectly fine. Uh, if you're working on an ingrain, like most likely you will be, that can imprint into the copper, the soft copper, if it's a soft enough grade of sheet copper. There is different grades of hardness, and if that's the case, you want to make this as smooth as you can working with it. So as smooth and fine of a sandpaper finish as you can bring this up to, the better off you'll be. Let's see here. Christoph Coosters. Hey Roy, what's the benefit of the hand cranked blower? Um, hand cranked blower doesn't require electricity. There's one big benefit. Um, second, second benefit is I have control. Blower's off, blower's on, I can go fast. I can go real slow. I can fine tune it. See? Anybody can see that? Yep, now it's in shot. So I can really fine tune the airflow, like when I get to forge welding temperatures and things like that. That's a little harder to do with a just a regular electric blower with a rheostat or with an air gate. It's a little harder to control the airflow. As with this, I can really put it spot on the amount of air I need in the fire. Less likely of you burning something. Yeah, less likely of me burning something. So if I'm like, hey, one of my clients just showed up, I can walk away. And even if I let that go, it's not going to burn up my piece because it's just going to eventually come to a stop all on its own. Yep. So that's one of the big advantages of it. Um, now, certain cases, like when you have really large material to work, it is a lot of cranking. It is a lot of cranking when you have large material to work. So, Daniel so. Moss says, stop showing off with your posh blower, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, sometimes I wish I had an electric blower on this thing, buddy. And if I was doing big hammers and things like what you're doing, and big stock, working with big stuff, uh, electric blower would be the way to go. So... Uh, Jason Earp says, I noticed the reins on your tongs. Wouldn't it be more comfortable if they were oval or even round? Uh, I guess if you had baby smooth hands, it would. <laughs> Don't take that as an insult. I'm not trying to insult. Uh, I wear a glove most of the time on my tong hand. So to me, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, even without a tong on my left hand, I mean even without a glove on my left hand, it doesn't really bug me. Um, a lot of guys will smooth them off a little bit. Nothing wrong with that. Not at all. No less, it's no more or less manly to take and have smooth tong reins. Uh, I just, I simply don't take the time. I forge them out to length, I get them riveted together, I get the job done, and then they go up on the rack. And I guess I just don't take the extra time to smooth them off. It doesn't bug me that much. So, uh, If you want to smooth your tongue reins off, definitely do that. Chuck Howell says, that would make a good video about making a guillotine tool. What about it, Roy? 
yeah, I actually have a video on uh, a guillotine tool. I don't know if I had the making of that guillotine tool video. I think I made a video. I think I made a video on my guillotine tool. I made this arch frame design. Uh, I could be wrong on that oh, one. Yeah, yeah. We but did I do sell plans for, for that. I believe mm -hmm. I did do that in a video. Yeah. I made this in a video. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, we have the plans for that for three dollars and ninety nine cents at blacksmithpdfs.com. Yeah. yeah. I, I may try to do. I, if I didn't make a video on this specific one, I may try to do a different kind of uh, guillotine yeah. tool. You did. To take you were showing off how to make a miniature rose. Is what it was. Do you remember that now? Okay, like yeah, but I don't think I showed me making this. Yeah, no, I guess not. I can. I can probably do a video on this if you like. Uh, now this other this other guillotine tool that I'm about to use, this isn't my design. I don't know who came up with it. Uh, I do know that this was offered by my uh, black my blacksmithing club sofa, and so uh, I don't really have any of the rights or things to share around how they make it. Uh, you know. It was cut out of a piece of C-channel, and then it's got some threaded and tapped blocks here so you can remove these plates and use smaller tooling. A jam nut here for tightening your dies and making sure they're tight in here. And then obviously a welded on hardy stub. Pretty simple thing. I could try to make a video on doing something similar. I won't copy the exact thing, but I do something similar. Okay, so that's actually where we'll be going next. So I'll just pull it up here so everybody can see. Okay. So what we're going to be doing next, can everybody see me just mm -hmm. fine? Okay. So what we're going to be doing next is I have a pair of butcher dies on here. And these butcher dies, they just got to bang. Just the same thing like I call uh, anything that has a leading edge is a butcher of some sort or has an edge, a blade, or something of that nature, you call a butcher. But this die here, it's meant to push the material away from the shoulder. This makes it easier so you don't have to use a monkey tool so much to get in there and square that up. It also helps leave a nice square edge that when I go to file it later to get it true, it's going to make things a lot easier on me. If I didn't use this to chomp down through there and I just used a pair of flat dies like what I have here, if I just use a pair of flat dies, like what you see I have here, okay, as soon as you hammer down on the piece, it has a little bit of this. Here, we clean this off. Get my little hydraulics here. Can everybody see that okay, hon? Yep. I'll just going to thing. If you see jiggling and it's getting, the focus is weird for a second, it's because she's got to roll the casters of this boom across the shop. Can you see her right in here just fine? Yeah. Yep. That's good. Okay. So, when you hit a piece of steel, okay, so say you got a piece of steel out here, just draw it all the way out, okay? When you're trying to draw a tenon down and you just got two square bits that are coming down, you would think that that pinched between these two points would produce a nice clean square corner as you forge a tenon down, right? Mm -hmm. So you would think that that would produce this really nice clean corner, but it doesn't. It has what it call, what's called drag. So it actually pulls the top surface material into where you're drawing it down. And so what happens in this case is as you hammer this closer, you get something that radiuses off like this into your tenon. So when you draw your tenon out, you've got something that looks like that. Not crooked and do goofy like that. Let me draw this out better. Sorry there, ladies and gentlemen. You have something that looks more like this, like a bank instead. It doesn't just draw it square. Mm -hmm. And there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, one of the simplest reasons is unless you're a power hammer, you can't hold yourself and your swing of your hammer and those dies perfectly square in a guillotine tool. They have slop to the left and to the right 
and they both have just a little bit of wiggle and just a little bit of jiggle, not like a power hammer dies. But even under a power hammer dies, if you look, notice after something's been drawn down, it has a bit of a radius to that outside corner. So it doesn't have that crisp, sharp corner as what you would get. By reducing this surface area here, instead of it being a square like that, and you create a bevel like so, like in the case of the guillotine tool, you actually have less of that distortion. You'll still get a little bit. It's still going to suck down a little bit, but not as bad. And so, yeah, that's the reason for these guillotine tools. And the one other thing that it helps with is, you know, you're not eliminating the material. The material's not disappearing. So as you hammer down, it's pushing. This bevel is pushing the material linearly. So it's pushing it that way, which is the way you want to draw your tenon out anyhow. And so it also gets the bulk of that material away from your shoulder so you can hammer it out at the anvil. Now obviously if you have a power hammer and you got perfectly square dies and stuff and everything's hitting true, this is all kind of irrelevant uh, to you if you have a power hammer. If, if you don't and you're doing it by hand, it's very hard to get a perfectly square shoulder just by feeding it into a guillotine tool without doing the butchers first. Hopefully that makes sense. Any questions on this? I mean, this is drawing out tenons kind of 101 here. Mm -hmm. If anybody's got any questions, it would be a good thing to do. All right, shout them out if you guys got yep. me on that. Steve Olin, good explanation, Roy. Very good. Prescott Stoops, that explains it pretty well. So, good, good, good. will we be going up here then? No. Uh, yeah, we're going to be coming right in here. Forge of the tenon. You could just rotate it and point it there, and I'll just walk through. I'll just okay. cut through and. Rock wife says, "Learn something there." Thanks, Roy. Makes sense. You're welcome. So this first heat, I let. This is kind of cold right now, but this first heat, I'm just going to go ahead and mark it off. And then I'll come in and deepen everything with the second heat. So I'm going to come over here now, honey. Okay. So you can just leave it out however far you need to. Okay. There's not a lot of excitement going on here. Alright. So I'm going to lay off 5 8 square the material. I'm going to do that from the side profile first. So I can kind of see that 5 8 or 16 middle cube starting and get this all lined up. Once again, you've got a lot of time into this at this point in time, so take your time. This ain't a race. No one wins if you have to throw the piece into the scrap pile. Take your time, make sure your dies are lined up good before you strike. Imperative that you do. And only take one blow at a time. Okay, it's cold. That's cold enough for right now. Okay. Everybody can see this. Yeah. So, okay, can't see with the things, but. So now you can see how square that is across that line. There's minimal suck down. But if you look, I don't know, we need to get up against something else so people can see it here. Okay. Is this a good backdrop? Hold on there, ladies and gents. We're going to get it up here. I want everybody to be able to see what I was talking about here. Can you see that fine? There, well. There you go. Okay, that's still horrible. But all right, we're gonna try to we're gonna try to deal with this here. I think you're out of focus, huh? Okay, scoot back a little. Yeah, scoot back a little bit. All right, well. There you go. Looks like it focused. All right, yeah, I can't really I can't really show you on this, but uh, you'll have to take my word on it. 
this side here has more sucked down than what this side does, essentially. So, and that's because there's less surface area being dragged down into the groove than from over here. And that's what we want. So I'm going to deepen that down a little bit yet, and then I'll go ahead and start forging that out. And if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and start asking them. Sorry about the shaky cam. We're going to work on that. We do have what they call a three-axis gimbal. And we need to get that out. The problem with it is, is we can't have our case mounted with the three-axis gimbal. We have to take my protective phone case off which in turn exposes all the delicate stuff about the phone mm -hmm. to all the elements of the shop, So, yeah. which is kind of a big bummer. So we're working on getting that corrected due to the three-axis gimbal, mm -hmm. and then everything will be buttery smooth and you won't have any problems with it. Yeah. Questions, questions, questions. Sorry, I'm All right. Uh, rock wife, die, uh, dies mild steel or hardened steel? Uh, dies of guillotine tool? Yes. The dies of the guillotine tool are mild steel. If you want them to last longer than the six years that I've had these, make them out of hardened tool steel. Mm -hmm. These are mild steel and they've lasted me for about six years. So that's not a daily use. That's, you know, so take that with, you know, take that however you may. It's not a complete daily user. <coughs> I use it on occasion though. Um, I would probably say more than most will use their guillotine tools. In my opinion, it's not worth spending out the coin on high carbon steel, especially in that thickness. Those dies there are about five eighths of an inch thick and about two and a quarter inches wide. So that'd be awfully expensive tool steel. Here, um, is it still heating? Uh, yep, we're almost ready. Okay. So, Tekron Matic, I used rail track for my dies, heat treating them, and they seem to be working well. Oh, there you go. You can do that. Do it that way. Are we going back? To the I door? am a. Yeah, we'll be going right back to where we were at. Okay. Uh, let me find a wrench to tighten up that bottom dog. Oh. Um. First thing you'll understand about me, that you gotta understand about me, I am not, I'm not a tool steel metallurgy fanatic. Okay? I like metal, I, I like good tool steels if I can get my hands on it, and I'll use it for stuff where I need it. But when it's stuff that don't matter, like this, I don't use it. It's just as easy. You know, this tool, it gets used enough to mushroom the tops like you see here. So, I mean, I do use this tool quite a bit, but uh, it does not have to hold up to, like, a production run of a thousand pieces going through it. So, it's not worth the money, the time, the effort to put in tool steel. Heat, treat, do all that other bogusness. Like I said, six years later, and here we are. It's still holding up. And it's just mild steel. If you bring out the steel hot... And you don't, and you're not working cold material underneath this, or like titanium, or like a really hard steel of some sort, like an air hardening tool steel, and working down into the darker temperatures, you'll be just fine with mild steel. Mm -hmm. uh, but once again, you kind of have to select your steel for what you're doing. So. All right, now we'll come in here and deepen all these cuts again. They're not really cuts, they're just kind of like really narrow fuller points. I'm going to go ahead and just knock off the sharpness of the corners a little bit. And there's a reason for doing this, okay? The reason why you want to knock off the corners down here in this joint is they are a potential place to cause a stress fracture. So as you're drawing out this tenon, that's the first place a stress crack will want to open up is on them real thin neck down areas there. They'll want to open up. But now see I've drawn that billet there further enough away from this shoulder that now I can draw that out into a tenon 
and not have to worry about smashing this thing with my hammer at the anvil. Mm -hmm. And when I come back to this, after I drawed out most of this, I will come back with these square dies then and work right up here into this square corner and clean that all up. Any questions? Let's see here. You can answer all you mean. Okay. Let's see. DJ Waters, he has to run. He's getting the death stare from his wife. <laughs> Tell her to hold her horses. Roy's talking here. <laughs> No, don't tell her that. I'd like her to like me and yeah. let you come back and watch live streams. <laughs> Dakota Territory Blacksmithing said a guillotine tool is something I've been seriously considering. I uh, just uh, sing in the same blues as everybody else. I'm broke. LOL. Oh. Um, I'll, try, I'll try my best in the next few weeks. <coughs> I'm already fairly busy as it is. I'll see what I can do about, you know, putting together like a cheap guillotine tool video. Um, one of the easiest guillotine tools to make is called a scissor guillotine tool or a swing arm. And it goes like this. And it goes from a central pivot point. I'll do my best to make one of those to show how easy it is to make. And you can usually do it out of pretty common found materials. So... I'll do that if I can. And for all you high carbon steel junkies out there, you can do the the die, the swing part, with a lawnmower blade. Oh, there you go. So there you go. Uh, Rock Life says, I have tong envy. Look at all them tongs. Drool. Yeah, uh -huh. drool, drool, drool. <laughs> Billy Strong says, where did you get your forge? Well, I don't know. Jessica got me this forge. A garage sale, yeah. Yep. Next shot will be over at the anvil, huh? So okay. you can adjust shot. it over there. Which part of it? Huh? Which part of it? I'm going to be right about here, drawing this out. Let's see. Charles May says, Blacksmith Supply in Richmond, Virginia has a guillotine kit for about 80 bucks, but you must assemble. Yep, that's decent if all the parts and components are in good shape. Depends on what they're made of. Crown Royal says, I want to say thank you. I just set up my coffee can forge and making a mount for my anvil. Your vids have been a huge help. Awesome. Glad to hear it. You're very welcome there, brother. Or sister. Don't know. Can't tell by screen name sometimes whether I'm talking to, to a lady or, the, or a guy. Mm -hmm. So, Steve Olin says, just decided on my next project. Thanks, Roy. Guillotine tool, here I come. <laughs> my videos want to be as good as Roy and Jess. Awesome. <laughs> Scott Elliott says, garage sale. Man, y'all have better garage sales up there than we do. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've only seen blacksmith tools like maybe two or three times <laughs> in the last 10 years. All right. So now drawing this down goes like any other drawing down ever in history. We're just trying to take and remove the thickness. I'm trying to work back up to that joint, but without hitting it. Like I said, I can reduce that at the guillotine tool. Now you may be asking yourself, Roy, why are you doing this on the flat of the anvil? It's easier to do it either by biting on the edge or hitting it on the horn. And I'm going to answer that to be a very easy question to answer. The reason for this being is on the horn or dancing around too much on the edge here, you take a tendency to knock this back and forth. I don't know if anybody can see that in there. Yeah, it's in focus. Yeah. So as you hit on one side, it goes that way. As you hit on the other side, it goes that way. 
and so on and so forth, so on and so forth, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. And what ends up happening? It does the coat hanger effect. It breaks. So on the anvil, I can have the most amount of control, make sure it's good and flat, and is well supported. That way, I don't get the back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then it cracks and snaps right off. Yeah, you'd be pretty unhappy if that happened at this stage. Very unhappy, trust me. There we go. So hopefully everybody can see this just fine. Here's the first stage of drawing out. Champ Ironwork says, drawing one inch stock by hand, Adam's power hammer. <laughs> Awesome. So I hope everybody likes that. Um, yeah, I mean, drawing out's a lot quicker using the edge or the horn, but right here you need control. You don't need speed, you need control. If you're a little winded, stop, put it back in the fire. Get some heat in it, take a drink of water, relax, come back to it, hit it, draw it out some more, relax, put it back in the fire, get a drink of water, heat it some more so on and so forth and take your time drawing this out because like I said you've already got several hours to got to this point you don't want to screw it all up here by losing that thing right now mm -hmm. so take your time you can see I kept most of my hammer blows pretty darn far away from that edge I want nothing to do with accidentally hitting in here and putting a hammer mark that I can't remove mm -hmm. at this stage in the game Now we'll be back over at the guillotine tool to thin out that thick area there a little bit. And then we'll continue drawing down. Rock Life says, excellent <laughs> explanation on that, Roy. I've experienced that walk on the horn. Good. Let's see. Steve Olin, the coat, thing, coat hanger effect question mark. Is that a thing or did you make it up? No, that's actually a thing. Um, that's a real deal. So... Any, take any coat hanger in your house, metal, aluminum, it could be anything, brass, bronze, you bend it back and forth, bend it back and forth, bend it back and forth, and, and it snap. stresses yep. the material in that area to a point that snaps. Well, you can do the same exact thing with steel, regardless of whether it's hot or not. Because chances are, the area that you're hitting that is hot, is the area that's going to break is not as hot. 10 to 1 odds. It's that thin little area that's already cooled down. It's already cooled down and it's taking all the same stresses that the thick area that's still hot that you're working is. And that's, that's what ends up happening with that. So if, if you guys out there have a lot of problems with falling leaves, like your leaves, you're forging out a leaf like the stem of the leaf and all of a sudden the leaf just cracks off mm -hmm. and falls to the ground. Most likely, you're having the coat hanger effect. That leaf, as you hit here, it's bending up. And then when you flip it, it's bending down. And then when you flip it, it's bending up. And when you hit it down again, it's bending down. Mm -hmm. And that comes from not quite having your material square on the anvil. And then all of a sudden, that leaf, at the very end, you go to shape, and it's like, clink, and it's a falling leaf. It hits the floor. Steve Olin says, I broke my slotted jaw tongs the other day, trying to twist it but let it cool too much. Yep. <laughs> uh, Corey Shire says, excessive bending work hardens the steel, making it brittle and breaks. Yep. Now, if that thing was hot as all get out, <coughs> as hot as all get out, you can get away with a whole lot of that bending before it'll break. But like I said, usually it's the thinnest area, the weakest link, that ends up breaking on you. And then, you know, I mean, well, you're just out for time. Nothing you can do about it, so. So I'm going to keep this hot. I'm going to go ahead and change the dies on this. Okay. Questions? All right, let's see. If I missed any of your comments earlier, feel free to drop those in again, and we will readdress that. Uh, Brian Neely, it happens to a lesser effect even when hot. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, Jack F., have you decided on your barrel design? 
barrel design. Yeah, you'll have to elaborate, Jack, what you're referring to. Barrel, barrel, barrel. Is that part of the tongue or the handle on the piece you're working? I'm not sure. You'll have to you'll have to refer again. Mm -hmm. Well, what you mean? Been a long, busy week, there, fellas. So I'm <laughs> sorry mm -hmm. if I'm not up with it. Let's see, Mark S. I would cry with this much work in a piece if it broke. <laughs> yeah, I cry from time to time. It's usually, I get so mad I throw it across the shop, and then I usually have somebody like my landlord just happen to be driving across, driving out front of my shop, and just kind of like looks. I'm like, hi, Roy. I'm like, oh, darn. I let my anger get the better of me every now and then. Barrel is the screw. Okay, barrel. That's so Champ Ironworks. Oh, have I figured out the, yeah. Mm. So, right now I'm thinking of forging, I'm going to forge, I am going to forge the ball screw on it, or the screw part of it, so I can show you guys how to collar weld a ball on the end to make that, because you're not going to draw that down from a large piece. I'm actually going to build it up from a straight piece. So this way the straight piece I don't have to draw out to exact dimension. It's already pretty much to dimension and all I'll have to do is thread it then. So the ball portion I need to forge weld a piece. And so I'm going to show you how to collar weld that and turn that into the ball at the end. And I'll show you what that will look like. Give me one second. Let me grab it. It's buried. Okay. Bear with me. You'll be digging for a little bit. All right. Bear with me. Let's I'll see. Charles it. May says, Roy, I copied your hammer rack. Hope you don't mind. Got what? Uh, he copied your hammer rack. How you have the straps going across like that. Use it up. Yeah. It's a good way yep. of organizing stuff. I salute it. Come on. You. Let's see, Jack, Jack F. says, thanks, really looking forward to that, the way you're going to do the screw. Okay. So, so, here's the, so here's the basic premise. So I got these. So what we do is we start with a collar weld. So this here is going to become a threaded screw. I don't know if anybody can see that. Yeah, it's in there. This is just the same original diameter. I believe this was a 3 8 inch rod or 9 mil. And then I wrapped a piece of stock around this and did a collar weld and then rounded this off. And so that's a pretty plain look there. That doesn't look anything like the ball that you see on a regular vise. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody can see that. Yeah, you can see it. There. Not a whole lot of dimension to it or anything. Mm -mm. Okay. And then you come back in with welding heat and you put in a fuller. And now it starts to look like a ball screw, don't it? Yeah. And so this still has to have a punched hole through it. You still have to punch a hole through this and drift it. And there's some debate uh, when I was taking the class with Tom Latney to take and make this vise. There was some debate on whether these were actually punched through or if they were drilled and then drifted. And the reason for that being is on the ball section itself, it all, it's always really crisp. There's usually not that suck in or that drag in like what you would get whenever you go to punch something. So the thought is, is that it was drilled and then drifted to size afterwards in a die. That's what they thought in the class. But essentially we're going to have something that looks like this mm -hmm. on a bar and I'll show you all how to forge weld that up. Mark S says, very cool and technical. <laughs> Awesome. Glad you like it. All right, we're going to come out right to here. All right. And I'm going to work out that little shoulder joint. Hopefully everybody's staying pleasantly entertained. If you are, hit that big like button if you can. Mm -hmm. And say that you're entertained. <laughs> Rock Wife says, I'm a new blacksmith, and the best advice I've learned is patience and focus. I don't know how you do this live feed, getting yanked around with questions and such. Much skills. Well, thank you. I'm very used to demonstrating. It's taken a lot of years to get to this point. I'm not, I'm not that, 
I'm not that young in the craft anymore, and I'm not that old in the craft. It's kind of a weird place to be. In between. I'm an in betweeny. Don't nobody finish that statement. <laughs> So now all I'm doing is just trying to get that material thickness right in there, down, and then I'm going to continue to forge that out. There, I've isolated some more of that thickness out there. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we can see that. Now I'll continue to draw that out. So see, you don't need a power hammer for everything. It makes life a hell of a lot easier though, I will tell you that. I could have had this thing done like an hour ago. Had I put it on the power hammer. Uh, yeah. Let's see. And I wasn't demonstrating and yakking and that whole jazz. And that whole jazz. Steve Olin says, you go good with weird, Roy. I go good with what? Weird. Go good with weird. Thank you. Uh, Sillalop says, but we are happy you are. <laughs> Rockwife says, my first live feed, and this is fun and very entertaining. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Thank you for being here. Herb Page says, if you had a striker, you could use a flatter to reduce the area before the shoulder, LOL. Yep, certainly could. Jessica's not into striking right now. No. She's into reading comments. Yep. <laughs> Scott Elliott says, was more entertained when Jess was on cam. <laughs> <laughs> hey now, what am I? <laughs> I know, I know. She's better looking anyhow. So one of the things you can do here... Um, that, oh man, I've just got to mess up your name. Herb Page, I believe, just pointed out about having a flatter to reduce some of the material, okay? You can actually do this with set tools. He's absolutely right. You can use a bottom tool and a top tool and a striker, and it's just as efficient. And if, actually, it's more efficient because you can focus on what you're doing, set it, and somebody can really nail that thing with a sledgehammer and really move the material fairly quickly. And so you can have a set hammer like this come right up to that shoulder and pinpoint accuracy set that material down. Uh, just like before though, on the banked, on the butcher, you can have that on a tool like this, a top tool. So you can literally have that shape there on a top tool to segregate that shoulder out and do this by hand without a guillotine tool. That makes sense. I don't know if anybody can see that at all, but. Yeah, it's in there. There you go. So that's a very good point. Uh, Techromatic says, hey Roy, I just did an analysis on Google for the video interruption. It said 360p is smooth in my area, but 720 or HD will have interruptions. Oh, that's darn. So I guess that's been maybe perhaps part of the problem. Yeah, that might be part of the problem then. Let's see, uh, working with iron, late again. But you made it here. It's not I'm over glad yet. I'm happy here. Prescott Stoop says, lots of mushroom mushrooming on the guillotine top. Uh, yeah. That's pretty much been there since. That, that occurred the very first time I used it for about, that's about a week's worth of work on that and it hasn't gotten any worse from there. So I think the surface of it's work hardened enough where it's decided to resist deforming anymore. That's my theory on that. Uh, it being mild steel, it is not as imperative that you dress that mushrooming off. Now, as I just said, it might be getting to the work hardening point where it's been work hardened enough. So it might be a good idea to just take a flapper, like a good flap disc, and just kind of run some 45 degree bevels on the thin parts and uh, leave the rest alone and that will probably take care of that. Mm -hmm. But 
if you got a high carbon tool steel tool that has that, you're asking for trouble. You're going to snap off a little bit of it and send it flying either into your eye or your arteries or neck, face. I don't know. It's going to hurt. So mm -hmm. uh, it might it just take a few seconds to rip that off with an angle grinder. No problem. All right, we're good and hot. Up to almost welding heat. To here. Nope, here. we're going to go right over here to the ample. All right, we'll get readjusted. Yep. Now, I'm only going to forge this square, and the reason why I'm only going to forge it square is because I'm going to file the part or the bit that I need round to perfectly round. The parts that I don't need round, so the handle won't spin. It's going to have a wooden handle, and I don't want it to spin. Does that make sense to everyone? Jesse Menace says, my first time on your live chat. Thank you for sharing the information. Very well. You see, GMP Ironworks has had pretty beefy striking anvil. What's it made out of? It is made out of mild steel, about three inches thick, by about 12 inches wide, by about 16 inches long. All right, I'm just cleaning up these faces. I'm going to have to come back in here and clean up these joints, thin this out a little bit better. All right, can everybody see this okay? Yeah, looks like focused recently. Right there. All right, so there we go. We got a pretty even thickness. Got a fairly nice square shoulder there. Enough that a file will be able to take care of. And so I won't forge this anymore. Now it'll just be filed square. And then this bit will be filed round. I just touched that metal totally with my finger. Oh no. Oh, I didn't feel a thing. <laughs> I was like, oh, my finger got slippery there for a minute. That's not good. If your finger gets slippery when it touches hot metal, it's probably because it's burning and you don't want to do that, okay? It's so no thing. touchy. I can tell you, it kind of just feels slick across there. Anyways, enough of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave portion of this square. And then I'm going to take the other part I'm going to file it down to kind of octagon, if you, if you will. And then the last bit of it, I'm going to file round in order to be able to thread it. So I can put a decorative nut on the end of it. Prescott so, Stoop says it kind of smells like bacon. <laughs> <Burn your finger. laughs> it does. It does kind of feel like, smell like bacon. So really the thing at this point, I'm probably going to take one more heat on this and just make sure everything's kind of in line. I can see where I need to put a little bit of a tap here to line this stem back up perfectly because it's a little off one direction. Uh, so I'm going to get another heat on this. I'm going to bump that down to bring it up slightly because right now it's kind of bent down in that direction. So I want to kind of bring it back up and then yeah, that's going to be done. I'll do my final planishing. I'll go ahead and do a really quick brushing on it, and we'll show you all the results in detail there. Yeah. But how are we doing at, on time? We're at an hour and 40 minutes, so good, good chances it'll be right about two hours total. Good. I'm doing pretty good about that time management thing, ain't I? You are. Oh. Now, one thing I really respect about Tom Latney when I took, a, when I took an internship with him, um, he's really meticulous at writing down time. 
So he writes down, and he does really good illustrations. That's another thing I respect about him. That's something I hope to get into someday, maybe. Maybe as I get older, more patient, and maybe more wise, I'll start doing that. Uh, but he's real meticulous about writing down very specific measurements and how things drew out and what they did and what stock he started with, things like that. And he illustrates it. But not only does he illustrate that, but he writes down his time. So he'll write down, it took me 3 hours, 27 minutes, and 12 <laughs> seconds to do this. Wow. Or whatever it is. And then he'll go along and do that again. And what he does is he'll use that whenever he talks to a customer. When they're figuring out about how long it's going to take him to actually make something they're requesting <laughs> of him. Or what his time's going to be into it. Instead of him after the scratch, he said, I don't know, maybe a day and a half of work. Mm -hmm. Instead of that, he knows specifically that for him to make a tenon, it costs him this much time mm -hmm. in the shop to no make way. that tenon to his standard. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, he usually hits those marks all the time. So if he undertakes something new, he does the same thing. He writes it out, illustrates it. I got mass respect for him. And uh, I hope to be able to do that someday and be patient and learn and all that good jazz. Scott Elliott says, patience doesn't necessarily come with age. <laughs> well, then I'm hosed. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm a goner. I'm uh, a goner. Prescott Stoops, have you picked a wood type for your handle yet? I have not. There's a lot of gorgeous woods out there. Um, one I'm thinking is it's called, uh, what was it, lace something or another? Mm, I forget like lace oak or lace wood or something like that. I forget what it is. It's got like a really wavy, like a blonde color in it. I thought that, that might look real nice. Mm -hmm. um, maybe kind of stained a little bit. I don't know. There was some like a dark lace kind of wood. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was called lace wood of some sort. But I remember the lace was in the, was in the thing. Randy Nyman says, Roy, do you ever make stuff where you can sit down to do it? Uh... Not really. Not really. The, the most stuff I stand, uh, my my joint, the joint on my spine that's right above my hips isn't too good. It's where I was injured in my car wreck, and so bending at that joint is very uncomfortable for me. So like when I sit, I don't like sitting in a perfectly like L position. I like to be slightly reclined because where it's at, it protrudes into, well, I don't know, I'm not a physician. It protrudes into something that hurts, and so therefore I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I don't do bending very well. I don't like doing bending, and so I'd rather stand upright, and that's also why I don't like, you, don't, you won't see me a lot where I'm way down here bent over, because my back doesn't like that. And so mm -hmm. I bring everything up a little higher. Mm -hmm. I make sure I have great posture. That's why my hammer form favors out at the end of the hammer where it belongs. And that's why I take full strokes like you're seeing me do. And only when it gets down to the point where I can't see it, you'll see me kind of arch over to see what I'm doing. And I kind of even need to stop doing that because that's kind of bad for me. Mm -hmm. When I get down to that fine of work, I should just put a stake anvil in where it brings it up to where I can see it when mm -hmm. I'm just doing little fine taps. But Yeah. Champ Ironworks, are you planning on having the next live stream next Friday at 7? Yes, that is the plan. Next Friday at 7 p.m. will be the next live stream. So, in that live stream, we got a lot of good stuff going on. In that live stream, pretty much all the principal forging is done on these pieces. Okay? So, I'm at a cross between either doing the ball screw portion or finishing these pieces up the hinge joint of these. And I may start on the hinge joint portion and, and start getting that bit finished up. Uh, <laughs> the problem is you got to do rough forging to a point, and then you have to do file work. And you got to get everything fitting right. And once you get everything fitted right and everything's square, everything's level kind of like you want it, on the hinge joint and everything's working freely, then you put all that together, right? Like so, so there's a little file work, a little prep work I got to do. I'm debating on whether to do that on camera. I hope if everybody wants to see that, I'll do the filing and the prep work. And then if we get the time, we will go ahead and do like the rivet joints and 
actually get it to where it's hung on the on the piece. I'll leave it up to you. What do you want to see? What do you okay. want to see next weekend? You guys do you want to see me that. forge some more and get some more components forged? Or would you like to see this thing actually get to a point where it's together within the next week or two? Vote. Yeah, put a vote. <laughs> oh, on the community tab, if you're subscribed to me, please ring the bell for notification because I do community posts. What I'll do is I'll do a community poll. Oh, there you go. Because I can do a poll. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask those questions again, and you can vote on the poll what you would like to see me do next weekend. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's either forging more components for the vice, rough forging, or it's doing all the filing and fit work to get ready in the following week to be able to assemble the hinge portion of the vise. Okay, let me read some of these here. Champ Ironwork said, I'd vote for ball screw forge welding. Okay. Uh, or page, the filing might be riveting, Roy. <laughs> it might be. Steve Olin says, filing sounds like a real blast to watch, LOL. <laughs> uh. It's not. You're just going to see me doing a lot of sweating. But in that, I get to show file form which mm -hmm. is very important. Yeah, a lot of guys hate filing and it's just because you suck at filing. And once you learn the form about it, it's actually very quick. You can remove a lot of material quickly with a file. Billy Strong says we want to see it all. want to see it all. Good answer, Billy. Jack F, whatever is next in the natural progression. Okay. Uh, Champ oh, Ironworks says filing stream sounds like a five hour video. <laughs> no, nah, still only be two hours. Mm -hmm. Two okay. hours of solid filing, though. So yeah. prepare, <laughs> buckle up. Bring your comments. We'll need something to keep us well, keep you it know lively. What? You know what? I'll tell you what. I'm probably going to do that at some point. We'll 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 take a vote on whether we can just do forging right now. It won't matter. You're all are in for a treat. There's going to be a lot of filing on this vice. There's going to be a lot of ornamental filing. There's going to be a lot of decorative chase work going on on this and engraving so there, there's going to be a lot going into this so this is going to be a long-term project so you might as well settle in grab a bucket of popcorn a beer or whatever your thing is a cola a smoothie if you're a health guy like me carrot sticks and celery carrot sticks and celery and just settle in for the long haul so let's go over the anvil real quick all right um the way we'll do that I will still do the community tab poll to bring in some extra stuff, but if you guys want to care to put your vote in on the replay of this video, just put your vote there too as well for the guys that don't get on the community tab much or whatever. Just put it on the replay of this video. Just put it in the comment section, and we'll take a vote that way. All right, ready? Down at the edge. All right, so now... All I'm going to do is I'm going to set the low side down and then I'm going to give it a half on half off blow. And then a little more. It's almost there. There we go. Nice and straight. Perfectly. Everything's nice and square. And just refining all the hammer marks out of it if I can. This is very light forging. Give that a little clean up. Charles May says, how do you get to the community tab? The community tab is just like as if I posted a video, but instead of it being a video, it'll usually just have words on it. It'll look like kind of like a news feed, like a Facebook post. And that's how you get to the community tab. It's only when I post something, I think. Other than that, I don't know from your end. I'm apologizing right now. There we go. And that's what a file can cure. Dakota Territory Blacksmithing said filing actually used to be a trade. Yep. Techronmatic says good filing techniques are becoming a lost art. That they are. And like I said, a lot of a lot of people hate filing. And I've found a lot of guys that say, oh, I hate filing. I hate filing. And you watch them file, and you're like, well, I'd hate filing too. And so 
I've helped a lot of I've helped several guys out with that on their thing where they hated filing just by showing them the correct way of filing. Proper form is everything. Randy Nyman says I'd like to see how you make a spring fuller. Okay. Let's see. Champ Ironworks has said you need to click on the channel, not just view it from your favorites page. So Okay, uh, you gotta check click on my channel to get to the community tab, I guess. Thank you for putting that out there. Like I said, if you can't figure it out, just come back and comment in the comment section of this video. And we'll take the vote from both places mm -hmm. and pull it. And that way, you know, I kind of know where you guys want to see next. Um, I'm fine with just telling you what you're going to see next. But mm -hmm. I like to get involvement from everyone. If I can. Because I feel like it's everybody's channel, not just my own. I may be the purveyor of it, but you guys are the ones that are nice enough to come and listen to me yammer. So, I don't know if you can see that, hon. Mm -hmm. Which are you wanting can to you show? show off a certain part? Yeah, well, I was I'm trying to show them it all put together. Here, here, just leave it there. It's fine. Okay. I'll try to get this to set on there fine. Okay, now you guys can start seeing it come together now, hopefully. So there we go. Now you guys can start seeing it come together. Mm -hmm. And heck, it almost looks like a leg vise, don't it? <laughs> almost. Almost. Just a little different. For a little different purpose. Randy Diamond says, is that what they call a post vise? Yep. Post vise, leg vise, it's very similar. So, yeah, I've got a little bit more work to do, some file work and stuff get this all lined up right. Christoph says looking smooth Roy. Charles May says nice. Paul says very nice looks like a post vice. Lynn Bradstead says I like it. Billy Strong says looking good. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. So all right so we're getting closer. Getting closer. So you can see so you all can see how, how much work this is. You know, I mean, this is quite a bit of work. It's more work really demonstrating than what it is for me to just do it. Um, but if you're undertaking this process uh, for your first time ever trying to make one of these, it's going to be a lot more work than what it looks on camera, like what I'm doing right now. Um, especially if you're not associated with some of the offsetting and the stuff that I've had to do here or you're not particularly familiar with those techniques. I don't know if they can see my face or not. Yeah, they can see me? Okay, they're just talking my chin. Hey there, guys. <laughs> there. So, sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, so this is a, it's a very challenging project. But something I want to point out to everybody who's just beginning at this and guys that have been doing it a while and still like, wow, that's really a project there. I don't know if I'd want to undertake that or not. The thing that I'd like to point out to most of you is the fact that although this looks like a challenging project, this has not went outside the confounds of all the basics or the fundamentals of our trade of blacksmithing. Pretty much everything's been implied here, everything's been employed here. Drawing out a tenon, that's a basic. You know, that, that's a fundamental building block. Uh, punching holes, fundamental. You know, drifting, fundamental. Drawing out, fundamental. Upsetting, fundamental. Those are all fundamentals, okay? Um, creating square corners and things like that, that's starting to get a little higher up there, but it's all still basically fundamentals. Twisting, bending, punching, drifting, forge welding, all that stuff is still fundamentals of blacksmithing. So this is where I say all the time in my videos, it's very crucial for you to get a good education in the fundamentals. And, and it's good for if you, even if you think you know everything, go out and take another fundamentals class from somebody who's better than you or somebody that you admire and look up to. Um, even if you think you're past that point, it's just good to refresh yourself on these type skills. Um, and you'll catch yourself doing things that you're like, 
man, I've been doing that for six months that way. I can't believe I let myself do it wrong for six months. You know, because you get lazy, you kind of you kind of get used to, well, it's just easier to zip it off on the grinder or it's easier to throw something under the power hammer or press if you've got one or it's just easier to take the easy way out. And when you take a class with someone and you learn the fundamentals all over again, they don't let you skimp out on that. No, you have to be at the anvil. You have to perform the task and you have to perform it well. It doesn't matter if you're an experienced smith of 50 years or if you're a greenhorn that's just shown up and you have never picked a hammer up a day in your life, they're not going to let you off the hook. So those, so that, those are very important for us to keep our continuing education in the craft of blacksmithing. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody to try this, you know, try some of these techniques that you're seeing me do on the weekly live streams. And then if anybody gets further enough along or gets caught up to this point and you have questions, you know, we can work, we can go through this whole smithing experience together. And I really enjoy that. I would, I, I would really enjoy that. You know, don't feel pressured if you think it's too much for you to do. That's okay. But, you know, if you can, give it a try. Give it a try. Greg Brown says, I got a long way to go, Roy. <laughs> Mark S. We all do. <laughs> Mark S. says, it may be outside my skill level, but it's good to see the fundamentals in a large project. Yep. Brian Ely says, your work is prettier than you, Roy. <laughs> I know it is. I know it is. Uh, Paul says, teaching is always more work, but we appreciate it a lot. Thank you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. The reason why teaching is a lot of work is because you have to project your voice you have to remember to tell people what you're doing. And a good teacher will tell you and give you those, those little snippets and those little insights that otherwise would just not be discussed. So, you know, a lot of this, you guys could show up and watch me on a weekly basis. I could not talk to you and I could just knock this out and get it done. I'm like, okay, well, I made this part. It's done. Now I'm moving on to this part. It's done. And just assume you know everything. But just those little, the, just those little in, intricate things like the guillotine tool portion, about talking about the drag that drags down there. So one of you, somebody out there, is going to use that information, and you're going to be able to make way better tenons than you ever have to be able to draw stuff out. Even knife makers, knowing that information there will allow you to draw out hidden tangs or tangs on knives so much easier than trying to work at square at the anvil and then wondering why it keeps pulling stuff in and then you have to keep grind that out, you know, and it gets thinner than you want and then blah, 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 blah. I'm not a knife maker, but <laughs> point is I've seen it about a thousand times on YouTube. People make that mistake. But those, those little intricacy things, that's what make, that's the difference between a guy that does it full time for a living that looks like he's just doing it as smooth and easy Sorry, the wind's kicking up and the door's rattling. That's the difference between somebody who's kicking, uh, taking and looking like they're making it easy because they're employing all those little tiny little techniques in there and constantly adjusting and fine-tuning, you know, as the project progress. And if you don't, a good teacher will stop and notice that he's doing something that would make a good uh, point to pull out, bullet point. Paul says, I taught martial arts for years. I learned far more teaching because it makes you refocus on the basics. Uh, yeah. Because you would think everybody knows how to kick somebody in the face, but <laughs> a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't, including me. I couldn't get my leg up high enough. Billy Strong says, oh my gosh, Roy's talking about knives, lol. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to give you guys a fun little thing. Guess what? I made my why I don't make knives video this That's week. Right. It's going to be coming out this weekend. Very shantly. Very shantly. So be on the eyes out. And guess what? I forged a knife in it. <laughs> it's quiet. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I, they can't talk. Oh, but. they can't. <laughs> Herb the can't floor. wait. Oh, to gosh. See. All right, let's readjust. Herb says he can't oh. wait to see that video. <laughs> It'll be an entertaining one. Yeah, it's an entertaining one. It's a long one. It's about 20 minutes long of Roy ranting. I keep calling it a mini rant in the video. It's not a mini rant. It's a big rant. Oh, but I thought I, I thought I had a real, I think it was very tastefully done, if I do say so myself. 
I think so. Scott Elliott says, I thought cops were at the door. Yeah. <laughs> when I was rattling. Let's no, see. You, you'll see me running. <laughs> uh, ben Aguilar, and you're a great teacher. Keep up the good work. Thank you. I appreciate the compliment. Uh, Champ Ironworks had said, without fundamentals, all the expensive equipment will just help you make trash twice as fast. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jeff Sandling, yeah, I went to answer this one. You said it a couple of minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, hey, Roy, have you put any more thought into posting a viewer project slideshow? My daughter wants to send some pictures and would love to see what others are working on. <coughs> this yeah, is that would actually, be great. Yeah, we're actually doing this as part of our 10K giveaway. Um, Roy kind of mm -hmm. mentioned it. And so we are going to put everybody who's tagging us or either emailing it to us or tagging mm -hmm. us on Instagram. Uh, when we go to do the actual giveaway, um, yep. we're gonna do a slideshow of that. Yeah. So, so so you can so you can email me your pictures at Christcenteredforge at gmail .com, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do that and get entered in there and you know just give a little note of uh, you know what's inspired you to do this uh, you know craft blacksmithing if we inspired you in some way we love to hear that uh, if you know somebody else inspired you that's cool too put that. You know, put that little note in there with your pictures so you can give them some context. Um, we're not going to be using the notes that people are sending us because the video would be way too long. We're going to try to fit everybody's photos in, depending mm -hmm. on how broad, how many photos we get. Obviously, mm -hmm. we'll have a little bit. I mean, nobody wants to watch two hours of photos going by. So, uh, I don't know. Some people might be into that. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, But we'll, like we're going to try to fit as many photos in as we can of everybody who's who's sending them that that way so um, and if you want credit make sure you say credit due or some and put your name mm -hmm. in there if you want us to put the text in there uh, associated with the picture of who's the credit for that for that photograph um, that, that'd be a great way uh, the other way you can go to is it Christ Center Ironworks mm -hmm. at Instagram mm -hmm. And go over to Instagram, and all you have to do is do hashtag uh, Christ Centered Ironworks 10K. Yep, hashtag Christ Centered Ironworks 10K, and that will get you entered into the giveaway for the hammer that I'm giving away. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's a great way of doing that. Yeah. I'd love, I'd love to see what other people are working on. I really enjoy that, you mm -hmm. know, because there's a lot of people that you know you take pictures of your stuff. Or even keep that stuff around, and five years from now, you're going to look back and you're going to be like, wow, I've progressed yeah. a lot. I really like that. Yep. Uh, Charles May says, I'm looking forward to the Three Minutes in Three series. Yeah. That one's going to be a fun one. We, I couldn't help myself. I wanted, I really enjoyed our intro. So I just wanted to get that one out. That series won't be posted till February 1st. We'll be dropping those out there, and those will be coming every day at 3 o'clock. 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yep, Ohio so, time. Yep, Ohio time. So that'll be in addition to my regular videos that'll be coming out twice a day. So Prescott Stoop says, I want to see a different clock get smashed every time. LOL. <laughs> that the if you cost got, would if, add up. <laughs> if, if you've got this, Prescott, all day long, buddy, keep funneling me money. <laughs> I'll keep smashing them. <laughs> Champ Ironworks says, yep, 3 at 3 is going to do it, be a daily view for me. Awesome. I'm glad. So, yeah, we don't want to take a lot of people's time up too much. I mean, as far as, like, you know, it's midday, something, you know, you can, like, quickly watch. Maybe you're to or from the office or to and from the forge or break whatever, or whatever. Uh, on break or something. You know, we don't want to take a lot of people's time. Just something that you can kind of pull up, takes three minutes, and mm -hmm. it just kind of spouts out some business advice, yep. you know, uh, daily to kind of keep you daily charged. Mm -hmm. And energetic and ready to hit your business with all you got. Um, or just life in general. Become yeah. a better employee if, if you're just happy being an employee. So Yep. And so if you guys, when those start coming out, make sure you leave us comments if there's anything specific you'd like us to cover. And if we get the chance, we will um, do a video on that. Yeah. Or Paige says, when does Roy Rant's videos come out? <laughs> at random. <laughs> at, at random. They're random Roy Rants, when that's Ro for sure. When Roy's good and ready to rant. <laughs> yeah, when I'm good and ready to rant. Um, so, yeah, so the, I guess you could have counted, I guess you could have counted my reply video to everybody giving me a bunch of garbage about Instagram 
being very unhappy and sorely with me. Uh, that could have been kind of a rant. Um, it's it's not it's not really you know once again I understand there's a lot of people who just don't do Instagram. Uh, if anybody does do Instagram or anybody knows of how to get to the Instagram, just type it in Google search and you get there, you'll find that it's actually a lot nicer than places. It's easier than Facebook. It's easier to set up that, than Facebook. It's easier to set up than a YouTube account. You, you know, you pretty much, you type in your email and a password that you want to use and voila, you're an Instagram person. And they even got a nice little walkthrough tutorial at the beginning. And, and, and the only people you get in your feed are the people you follow. Mm -hmm. That's it. You don't get nothing else in your feed. Yep. No. None of the polit none of the politics, none of the, you know, the other stuff, pornography, things like that that goes out there online. You don't get none of that hokey pokey business. You only get the stuff of the people you follow. So if you want to follow nothing but blacksmiths, you'll have a great feed of nothing but blacksmiths. Yep. Paul says I had to have my daughter show me how to Instagram and it was pretty easy. Yeah, it, it is a fairly easy platform. So, you know, once again, we weren't trying to do that to leverage anything or do anything with that. It just, that seemed like the easiest platform that people could share photos. And mm -hmm. Jessica could collect those type photos and yep. all yep. in one Please. spot. So she didn't have to go hunting across four different platforms. Um, yeah, Champ by Ironworks says his Instagram just picks with comments. Uh, pretty much, it's, pretty much. it's photo central. Yeah, yeah, it's it's photo central. Uh, you can say a like a quick blurb about whatever the photo is to kind of give it context, and then that's it. And then people kind of get to heart it, like love it, or comment themselves, and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, short videos as well, <coughs> like sixty seconds is yeah. the max. So yeah, yeah, I have approximately, I have a little over three hundred and. 40 posts over there or something like I that. I think that sounds about right, yeah. Yeah. So I got a lot of my work that I do for the art side of things and for the business side of things that I don't do on YouTube. I've got a lot of my work posted there on my Instagram account. Corey Shire says, I just set up my Instagram account today and I was looking at your page. Great looking family on your Christmas card. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so anybody who doesn't have Instagram, I'm going to try to do a, show, a little video showing how to set one up. Um hopefully in the near future. Yep, yep. So those are some other things that we're going to be doing this year. We have a lot of great plans. We'll have to see how much we can get through. I have a lot of big forgings that's coming along. A lot of big things I've wanted to tackle for a really long time. And I think it's going to be fun as all get out. And I don't know if Daniel Moss is still here, but maybe I'll t time something just right when Daniel gets in here. He'll just have to hit me up and uh, see what I'm thinking. But uh, some of the work that I'm doing is going to require some sledgehammers, some strikers. So maybe I'll put out some, <laughs> uh, I'll let, let, let the call of help go out for some of these things and, you know, see what we can come up with. Uh, but not going to tell what it is just yet until I get all the materials together, get all the tooling built. But you'll start to sense what it is as I get a little closer to it this year. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be a fun year. It's going to be a wild ride. Uh, Paul Ellis, you can't figure out how to post. It will not let you post from a computer. Um, you have to post from a phone or a tablet to do a post on Instagram. Okay, I didn't so, know that. Yeah. yeah. I hope you heard that, Paul Ellis. Jessica will do a whole tutorial on Instagram. She'll do a little tutorial on how to start one up and how to make your first few posts. And uh, that way that will help anybody out that wants to try Instagram. We're not trying to push you towards that. If you don't want to, that's cool. Uh, just... You know, like I said, you could send your photos through uh, Christ, Christ Centered Forge at gmail.com if you want to do it that way. Yep. Uh, Champ Ironworks says, social media is getting a little crazy. Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter. Need a person to run all the sites. Yeah. Now, there's even more <laughs> out there than that. Uh, pick two. Pick your favorite and make those two your thing and don't yeah. worry about the rest. Yeah. I don't do, I know a lot of guys are on Facebook. I got burnt last time, like last year on politics and stuff. I've seen a lot of really nice people. I have a very diverse friend group and people who I've met and taught classes to and people that I've socialized with and things like that. And I just, uh, people let their, what their smiles, they really let show what's behind those fake smiles they give you. 
mm -hmm. uh, across the board. I'm not, I'm the least political person you're probably ever going to meet. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't believe in that. We won't get into Roy's beliefs. <laughs> not on my channel. That's not what I'm about. Uh, and so, like, yeah, just after that, I don't do Facebook anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. I took a year off Facebook. I didn't miss it, and I ain't going back. So, yeah. so I don't do Facebook. If you contact Facebook... Uh, through like our professional page and stuff, yep. it's Jessica that answers I, you. Yeah, I answer the questions, and if I don't know the answer, I get with Roy about Yeah, it. then she gets with me, and that's how that works. I'm more active on Instagram. Once again, there's no politics there. There's no, uh, there's no stuff trying to get in my feed and, you know, mess with you. Yep. So. Uh, Techronmatic, when are we going to see a Jess Rance? You're not. <laughs> I don't really oh, rant. Oh, come on, Tekron, mate. Come on. Seriously, Jessica ramped? Yeah. That, that, wow. I've got too mild of a oh. personality for that, so. Buddy, if that happens, your feet will get real cold. The center of the earth has probably cooled at that point before you hear that rant go on. <laughs> uh. That's great stuff. Yep. So, all right, well, we're right. two hours and ten minutes in. I all right, two hours and ten minutes, up. cool. All right, we'll wrap it up. So, um, you want to peek around the camera and say bye? Uh, sure. Go I'm gonna, if I let go, it's going to float. Okay, there you go. Okay, there you go. The top can, of can, head. can you see my head? It's, yeah, your belt shoulder. See mine? Huh? I should be in there. All right, let me walk around here. Okay. Uh, all right, so there's a pretty camera woman that's been a part of the whole deal this whole time. So... Thank you all. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for being a part of the channel. And, uh, you know, me and Jessica really can't say that enough. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, <coughs> we look forward to continuing this uh, long into the future. And, uh, yeah, pretty much. And this camera's give, <laughs> giving up the ghost. You're going to have to look at the top of our heads. Okay, I'm sorry. There you go. <laughs> I'm done fighting with it for the night. I got a few more tweaks to put on the boom. But, uh, anyway, so... So that's it for tonight. Thank you all for watching this video. Uh, thank you all so much. I can't see your comments from the other side of the screen. Uh, but, you know, we really do appreciate every, each and every last one of you. Thank you for your support and your comments. And thank you for all the good emails that are coming in. We are working hard at trying to get back with everybody and give you thank yous and, and, and comment to you very specifically. Yep. Uh, so just bear with us. I know we've been kind of slack on that. but Yeah, thank you for uh, coming to the live stream. I yeah, mean, thank you for coming to the live stream. Um, sorry if we didn't get around to your answer this time around. Uh, if you do, just keep asking uh, your questions. You know, if you just keep asking in the other live streams, and we'll try to do what we can, and through the comments sections on the videos, and and, and we'll do what we can to help. So, that's it. So, yeah. Thank you all for watching. Yep. Oh, and I guess we're gonna see you on the next live stream, where we continue this vice. little vice here. So, thank you all for watching. God bless you, and we'll catch you all on the next one. <laughs>